We are recording live, and I will. Okay. So I have to be really good. Be really careful what we say, because this could go throughout the world. And unfortunately, my wife called, and she never never really calls unless it's a big important reason. Yeah, take so. care of that, Joe. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. You could get one more chair somewhere, Joe. Maybe that chair in the oh, back. I got something more comfortable than that. I can grab it. What time is class end? What time does class end? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. We've got to be out here one o'clock. Nice. Beautiful. Thank you. I'm vertically challenged. I need to stand on something. Hey, oh, I hope it's okay. Oh, I believe so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Anybody catch my name? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> All right, here we go. You want to catch my name? Yeah. Mr. Yeah, Carter. Carter. Yeah, Jim Carter, living on the hill. No, I live in Jericho. I live right, on, right, on, right behind Jacob's store down on Park Street. You know where that is? Yeah. Folks sure. living in the flats, as it's called, lived there for 51 years. Uh, I have four students, four students, four kids. Five uh -huh. kids went to this school. So well, it's a pretty special spot. I'm not here just because I thought about 50 high schools doing this presentation. And I'll tell you why, why what we're all about. And so I will tell you what he's all about. Um, came here yesterday, then you probably 200 times over the last 20 years. Um, but we're out of school, it's talking about safe driver drive, safer driver. What's on your permit? Uh, who's Niels Boolin? How does Niels Boolin impact your life today? Particularly if you didn't come in a school bus. If you came to, came to school, see if you can guess what I'm going here. Um, if you came to, came to school in a school bus, Chittany school bus, uh, Niels Boolin did not impact you. They impacted the driver. But if you came in a car or a truck, a vehicle, I bet Niels Boolin impacted your life today. All right, who, who am I talking about here? What do you think, huh? What did Niels Boolin, because the, 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 the school bus driver got impacted by Niels Boolin, but not the students. Huh? Well, uh, not the test. I'll give you a visual clue. I'm going to pretend I'm the school bus driver. How many came on a school bus today? Oh, okay. I'm going to pretend I am the school bus driver. So you're in the back. Everybody all set? Right, here we go. Yeah. Niels Bullen. Uh, somebody's going to put his name on the board. Because um, we're going to talk about Niels. Because he's a huge impact on a lot of people's lives. So I did uh, Niels Bullen impact your life today? Yes. Uh, Mr. Barks, did Niels Bullen impact your life today? Absolutely. Yeah, it certainly impacted my life today. Um, he, was the, he was the inventor of this seatbelt right here. Saved a million people's lives. Niels Bullen, with that invention, saved a million people's lives. I'll ask a little bit later if any of you were in a car crash and if you have a seatbelt on. Uh, well, how many of you, oh, let's go back to the, uh, forget the school bus people now because you, we don't have them. In fact, a girl yesterday, a girl yesterday in this class at 8 o'clock, 8.40, said, why aren't there, school, why aren't there seat belts in school buses? And we could talk for two hours on that. That's not why we're here. But we could talk for a couple hours about why Vermont school buses don't have seat belts. Um, so anyway, how many of you, if you came in a car or truck today, uh, how many of you put the Niels Bullen belt on? Okay. All right, let's talk about the school bus. How many of you that came in the school bus today Put the Niels Bullen belt on. Ooh, nobody raising your hand. How come? Huh? No such thing. No such thing. There was a terrible uh, school bus accident down in uh, Moortown last uh, last week. If anybody saw this, kids go to Harwood Union High School. Oh. Oh, you saw it. Wait, when did it happen? Uh, last Wednesday, I think, or maybe two, maybe two weeks ago. Wednesday. Oh no, they had a car crash. <laughs> Uh, there was almost a catastrophe disaster down in Harwood Union High School. Here's a school bus. Just went up a hill, loaded with school, loaded with kids from Harwood Union High School. Icy, icy, slides back, slides back, slides back, slides back. Almost tipped over. There's a tree right here. If the tree had to head in there, then this would have come in. What do you think would happen to those 25 kids who were in that school bus? You know, they got some big, 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 big trouble and injury. injury. Anyway, all right, let's see how they go inside. Uh, okay, this is me. Now, this is the date we're going to talk about, two dates we're going to talk about. 
Sorry, you got a couple of days over here? Yeah, so um, I'm here uh, because um, Jim asked me, oh gosh, many, many years ago to accompany him because something in my life uh, happened that absolutely changed my life. And I would even go so far as to say that it saved my life. Um, and it has to do something with your license and what used to be on your back of the license, but now is actually on the front of your license. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Does anyone know what used to be on the back of the license? Way back when, when I first got my license. Probably not. So well, we'll talk about what it was, what was on it, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, what's on the front of your license, and we'll, we'll talk about that here. Okay, let's go over here. Uh, before we get going too much here, I gotta, I gotta brag about this hat. Uh, I just walked here with my Hill and a helper. I'm Sam Keith Carter, uh, who played, uh, graduated this school a lot of years ago, played college baseball, and played professional baseball, and now is a baseball coach. And Mr. Chandler was a baseball coach for a lot of years here, and you helped Mr. Chandler. Yep. And, uh, um, but I, I was fortunate enough, or lucky enough, to help Keith last year, we made it to the state championship. Uh, maybe we go to Centennial Field and watch us play last year. Oh, very good. Yeah, close game, got beat by those son of the guns over from CDU. That's a different story. I lost five to a good game, good game. We had a good team, we had a real good team. And I think we'll be pretty good this spring, too. So, some of my favorite hats, by the way. I'm just going to take it off right now. Okay, let's talk about, um, put the, word, the word tilt? Put that up there. You got it there. All right, tilt. Class ends at 1 over 5. We're actually going to get out of here at 1 o'clock, we hope. Plan to, anyway. Uh, but a tilt is uh, an acronym. It's an acronym. Letters stands for oh. Yeah, a bunch of letters that stand for something. And I actually made this up when I was teaching. I taught at Winooski for almost 30 years. I taught at UVM for 12 years, uh, class at, uh, the main class at UVM. But uh, I actually made up, uh, made up this acronym, TIP. Stands for today. Yeah, stands for today. I learned that. Okay? Um, stands for something. Because I want to make sure when we get done this class, you're going to walk out here and say, geez, I got nothing out of that class. Those guys are pretty boring. Didn't learn a thing. So I actually invented this acronym. You can't go to Wikipedia. You can't go to a uh, uh, dictionary and see the word tilt. It's made up. Jim Carter made it up about 25 years ago. And I used it as a teaching method. And it stands for what? Yeah. Tell him that. Good. OK. Um, McNeil's Bullen. Um, Neil's Bullen. Anybody before, uh, so I put it on the board, anybody, anybody know anything about Niels Bullen? No, who was Niels Bullen? Yeah, he invented the three-point harness and saved a million people's lives. Yeah. Okay, uh, that's a little bit about us. Anything else about us? Okay, let's, talk, let's find out about you folks. Hi. Jim. Orin. Orin. Look for there. Where did you play? Yeah, you. Play baseball. Yeah, that's right, you did. You got the JVs. Yeah, yeah I, I did. I was kind of focusing on the varsity. But, all right. Um, practice, practice. We have another month or so. Practice. All right. Um, why are you taking this class? To learn to drive better. To learn to drive better. You told me the class yesterday was a little bit remedial. But you yeah. said this is the AP class? I hope they prove it today. <laughs> yeah, AP drivers in. For sure. Hi. Hey. 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 Hey
Bye. Hi. Jim. Grace. What's your name? Grace. Grace? Grace. Grace. Why are you taking this class? So that I'm safe on the road when I get my license. How many of you want to get your license? How many of you, your parents want you to get your license? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, they're they, they, they probably sick of choking you around. Okay. Uh, Simon, do you remember the day you got your license? Uh, yes. You grew up in Essex? Don't yeah, you? I grew up in Essex. And I got my license back when it was over in the old North End. That's where the DMV was. Um, and I remember it didn't used to be two lanes all the way down. It used to be merge into the left lane, merge out of it, merge into the left lane. And I remember um, getting there, I, I passed on the first try. Um, and I think I got like an 86 or something like that on the driving test. Mm -hmm. I was a little bit bummed because I was hoping to get a perfect score like a lot of my friends did. But I'm here, I'm driving, and um, yeah, that's a little bit about what happened on the day that I got my license. I go to about 50 high schools or driving classes. I went, uh, I went to Mike Anderson's class last night. 27 kids in that class. Wow. Yeah. But anyway, uh, I, go to, uh, I went to Windsor early in the week. I go all, all over the state, Brattleboro, Essex, Mount Mansfield, uh, Musisquai. Uh, uh, I go to about 50 high schools a semester. This is the, the, this is the second semester. This is only the sixth class school I've gone to this semester. Wow. By June, I should be close to 50 schools. But everywhere I go, the driver and teacher can remember the day they get their license. That's how important it is to get your license. It's really one of those days that you can remember. And Mr. Barge can't remember if he had breakfast or not today. But you can remember the, you can remember the day you got your license. Yeah. Tell us about it. Friday. Friday. <laughs> it was a Friday, sunny day. We had a cross country meet, so I think that was a Friday afternoon up at Missisquoi. So I took the test and met the team up um, to run. You passed? Yes, I did. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes once in a while the primary teacher didn't pass and the students go, ooh. I, well, I can't admit to that, yes. Yeah, that's right. All right. Let's uh, yeah, black those boards together. Uh, so, Jen, Jim and I have a couple of props here, as you can see. Um, and these boards represent something in the class. Um, we do this, or what might this represent in, um, in a driver's ed class? I wouldn't be doing the, this in a math class necessarily. But what does this represent? Car doing what? Yeah, go ahead. Two cars colliding. Yeah, colliding so, or crashing. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Now, now, driving is a great thing. It's freedom, it's independence, it's choices, it's responsibility. It's a big deal. It is a big deal getting your license. Don't ever take it for granted. Let me give you a little quick political statement here. Um, my wife and I uh, live in the flats. We have four of our kids go to school here. Two daughters, two sons. But I'm going to make a political statement because I taught history for 30 years. I love politics and love history. And, um, but uh, I'm glad our daughters did not grow up in Saudi Arabia. I see a couple of people, Orin shaking his head, a couple of other people, Theo shaking his head, you're shaking your head. What's happened in Saudi Arabia in the last year about women driving? Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah women until last year, until June of last year, uh, were not allowed to drive. Let's imagine a country telling half the population that they can't drive. That's, that's just something about a country, I think. That's just my political statement. Okay, moving on here. Um, so I just put, what do you got there, Si? So I, um, there's a lot of times where crashes are caused by something. They're not accidents, so to speak. Accidents happen out of the blue. Um, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot of times crashes happen due to human error or something that's going on with the car or the environment. Um, so we have up here, I'm gonna ask you five things, or Jim's gonna ask you five things um, about what could cause a car crash. I'm kind of a hands-on, hands-on, but also a hands-up person. Just reach your hand, tell me something to feel. Yep. Yep. He's gonna put up his DWI, stands for driving while intoxicated. Now it's DUI, driving under influence. Yep. yep. Oh yeah, absolutely. So, sort of a distraction. And, yeah, yeah. I did my my driving career. I did deer probably at least three times. I have to get two. We got more. Yeah. Um, 
Do we say texting? Yeah, uh, distracting texting. Yeah, okay. Yeah. What's that? Oh, yeah, being tired. That is a big one. Yeah. Being, yeah. yeah. Uh, Mr. Bryant, you ever fall asleep driving? Yes, painfully okay. once. <laughs> Only once. Only yeah. once. Okay. We need one more. Or, or is hesitating here, but he's got one. Driving in extreme conditions. Yep. Oh, yeah. If you're looking for a little bit of maybe bad weather the next couple of days. He, he's praying for a snow day on Friday. Not going to happen. Well, you know, uh, yeah, snow days are, you know, I taught for 30 years. Uh, we're missing, we rarely had, because kids could walk to school. We're missing one square mile. We didn't have any snow days because we were no school buses. I drove by 20, there's 27 school buses parked out here. If I'm assuming sat at a school in Mount Nance of Japanese Jail in Albuquerque, that's a tough call. But you have 27 school buses on the road. Okay. Uh, let's talk about um, well. Let's talk about the DUI one here, real quickly. Um, I came up from where I live and I went down uh, 15, went on Packard Road, and right there by uh, uh, Mountain High Pizza Pie, Ace Hardware. There's a sign. Uh, I'm going to go into Essex later. There's one on the Circumferential Highway. I'm going to go to Burlington. There's one on, the, on Route 15 there by the Fort. <coughs> Anybody know what the sign means? Can we do, do we suggest what you think of sign means? Theo? Think before you drink. Yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely right. But it's a little more than that. Where do you see this sign? Yeah, go ahead. Think before you drink and drive. Think before you drink and drive. Yep. Yeah. Looks like a tilt here. Nobody knows exactly what this sign means. You're all right. You're right so far, but it means someone died in the spot. Someone died when the driver was stoned or drunk or using cocaine or LSD or pot or something. Somebody was driving under the influence. The one you see right in front of uh, Mountain High there in Ace Hardware was a girl in Warren. She was an 18-year-old. Um, she was soon at this school when she was killed by a drunk driver. Uh, when you get your permit, you go to South Burlington, uh, you've probably seen these signs around in the DMVs. What's this sign all about? Yeah, yeah, you, 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 you had to say yes, yes or no in person six. When you get your permit, you had to say yes or no. And if you said yes, of course you have a heart in your permit. We'll talk about that later. All right. Uh, so let's talk about texting. Do you text that? Yes. Uh, do you text and you drive? No. Why not? Um, because it's really dumb uh, and it's against the law. Okay, let me ask you this side. I don't know if I've, you and I have done this hundreds of times. But I don't think I've ever asked you, do you not text because it's dumb or because it's against the law? More because it's dumb. More because it's dumb. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Barr, did you text? Not right now. My phone's busy. <laughs> <laughs> do you text and you drive? No. I, I can't text well, period. Okay. When I first started doing this on February 12, 2000, I've done this almost 20 years. In another week, will be the 20th anniversary of me going around doing these presentations. I've done this before, I most of you were even born. But uh, like 20 years ago, I didn't talk about texting. Why? You no know, such thing. Well, let's talk about today. How many of you today, how many of you text? Raise your hand. All right? How many of you don't text? I'm the only weird person in here. Well, my granddaughter, Eva Carter, I know Eva, sophomore at this school. Uh, Eva told me about six months ago, I said, Pops, you don't text either. I said, Eva, I don't text. I said, Pops, you can get in the real world here. Come on. And it is a real world. It is a real world, I understand that. I can't remember a school that had gone to that not everybody taking driver in and in Vermont doesn't text. But, so about taking Eva's advice, about two months ago, my wife and I went to AT&T to get a, to get a cell phone. So I said to the salesperson, eh, you know, I don't need anything too fancy, and I just need something that I can text with and communicate with. So he said, I have just the thing for you. So he sold me this. I think, oh, is this the coolest thing you've ever seen? Huh? What do you think? Sorry. Oh, man, that's an old phone. <laughs> You're saying I'm old, is that what you're saying? No, I'm saying the old phone is old. Okay, all right. Let's talk about texting. Against the law in our state. And also, it's incredibly distracting. Well, how do I know that? I don't text. 
So about five years ago, I said, you know, I better find out about this Texan thing. If I'm going around the, around the state, and, and maybe I do a couple of presentations in New York, a couple in New Hampshire, but if I go around pretty much Vermont, and, uh, and I got to find out about Texan, why is it so dangerous? So I went to an expert, a neurosurgeon. What's a neurosurgeon? Uh, brain. Yeah, brain surgeon. Her name is Dr. Erica Sweet. She studied the brain for 15 years, so she told me why it's so dangerous. And back uh, five years ago, when I got talking to her, it was against the law in 31 states. Okay. Now against the law in 49 states. Which wow. would you, what guess? What, you give me a guess here. What state do you think is it still a law? That still, it's still a lot against the law of Texas. It begins with M. The state begins with M. Montana. Montana is correct, Theo. Did you know what you were guessing? No, I was guessing. You're guessing. <laughs> <laughs> Play the lottery tonight, Theo. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, it's against the law. Still, still, you can draw another letter in Montana. Why? Well, here's how dangerous it is. Let's go with. Great. Jim, thanks for volunteering, Chris. Uh, yeah, we'll give her a little steering wheel. She's been driving. Okay, I got the iPhone zero for this. Let's go with Orin, right? Yeah. Right. Thanks for volunteering, Orin. Right. Uh, right. Look, you're going to be driving on the other lane, Orin. Yeah. Which one do you want? Okay, here we go. Let's find out two things. What's the penalty in Vermont for texting and driving? And let's find out what Dr. Sweet told me. Who's Dr. Sweet? The University of Vermont Medical Center said the brain for 15 years. Here we go, Grace. All right, Grace, you're driving, so you're going to be looking that way. But you're going to be looking down and looking up. That's what Dr. That's what Dr. Sweet told me is the why it's so, so distracting. All right, here we go one-handed here. Yeah, look down and get a okay? Here we go. Down up. Down up. Uh, Grace, what town do you live in? Jericho. Jericho, okay. We used to be using the Jericho Sheriff. Okay, good. Oh, you're looking that way now. Okay. All right, here we go. All right, here we go. I'm going to be the Sheriff. I'm going to be the Sheriff. All right. You're on uh, Route 15. Good afternoon. Hello. Hello. Um, nice situation, please. So, uh, Grace, I've been following you for the last half mile on uh, Route 15. I saw that you were texting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, right. I hit the penalty. Let's bring up a penalty here. Yep. Yeah, twenty thirty nine dollar fine. That's a, that's a fine for anybody in our state. Anybody in our state that gets a bus that protects the drive. The next thing that's going to really affect um, Grace is she's going to get five points on her junior operator's license. What's going to happen, Mr. Bryant, if Grace gets five points on her junior operator's license in the state of Vermont? Suspended for 90 days. Yeah, you lose your license for 90 days. That's the penalty. So now you have a suspended license. The DMV, what's the DMV? Department of? Motor vehicles. Motor vehicles. I'm going to let you folks know that you're really important, Grace, that you tell your folks that you get busted for texting. But the, the DMV will let your parents know, and then the insurance company is going to let your parents know. And as Cy said, the insurance is going to double for the next two years, two or three years. Are your parents going to be happy with you, Grace? No. <laughs> no. no. Okay. Now, how does Orin, what's Orin doing up here? Well, the second part of this is what Dr. Sweet told me. Okay? So, um, a little hand for Grace. You're going to take your iPhone Zero with you. Okay? You're going to text me, Grace. Here we go. How does Orin get involved in this? All right, here we go. This is, a, this is the best. Mr. Barge over the years has given me a certain a tremendous number of tilts. Today I learned that about driving. But what Dr. Sweet told me is the most profound tilt I've had in the 20 years of doing this. Okay? Here we go. You do the iPhone 1, right? I'm driving. Now, Dr. Sweet said when you're driving, you should only use the left side of your brain. The left hemisphere of your brain is the part of the brain that allows you to focus, pay attention, don't get distracted, follow the rules. It's all a left brain activity. When you text, you use the right side of your brain. 
This is part of the brain that controls the, the manipulative, the creative, the physical, the kinesthetic. Different parts of your brain. But when now you're going 10, 20, 30, 40 miles an hour. It's going to confuse your brain. Here we go. Okay, right along. I look down, I'm getting a text. Oh, it's Grace. Grace is texting me. Whoa. I can't dish Grace. She, she, you know, we've been friends for years, right, Grace? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Grace. I can take one hand off the wheel. Hey, Grace. She says, hey. I said, Grace, where are you? Oh, I'm driver at Mr. Barge's class. A couple speakers today? Said, yep. Get inside? Said, yep. Pretty boring, are they? Said, yep. More boring than Mr. Barge? Ooh, she doesn't answer that one. Probably do. So they said to Dr. Sweet, okay, so what? So what? What's the big deal? What is the big deal about all that? Your brain gets confused. Your brain is confused. So what will happen? So two or three things will happen. One, you might step on the accelerator go really fast. More like it. Or you might step on, I think you put off the accelerator go really slow. And then you'll list to the left. What does it mean to list? L-I-S-T. You got it, Theo. Then you go here. Boo! Oh, man. <laughs> and, you know, might kill, might kill Warren. Uh, maybe his passengers don't have a seatbelt on. Might kill them. Might kill them. Might kill myself. It's incredibly dangerous. Why would it be against the law in 49 states in the District of Columbia if it's, if it's not dangerous? Um, well, how many of you... How many of you have been in a car where the driver was texting? Don't tell them what Jim Carter, I'm just a social study teacher, baseball coach, parent, grandparent. Tell them what Dr. Sweet said. Tell them, you know, say, say uh, your mom or dad is driving. Say, but mom, dad, neurosurgeon has studied the brain for 15 years. So it's incredibly dangerous to do what you're doing. Be courageous and do that. And tell yourself right now, promise yourself right now, I will never text him about now, Grace and I have been friends for years, right, Grace? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you wait five minutes for me to pull over or wait till I get home, won't you? Yeah. You're not going to dish me because I don't get right back to you. A little hand for her in here. Uh, okay. This one. Okay. Uh, talk about seatbelts. Um, Right. Yes. These are the first belts. But how about when you were 15 or 16 years old? Uh, your seatbelt use never, sometimes, most of the time, always. I've always been an always. Why? Um, because my parents have always uh, were really strict. They're almost like helicopters, where they're like, "Sign, you have your seatbelt on." Oh, good. And so, the, uh, whenever I got into the car, they would always check my seatbelt. Um, and then as I got older, it just got into a pattern and a habit. So um, taking a seatbelt and just putting it on is, was just as natural to me as, you know, doing a, brushing my teeth in the morning or, or, you know, getting up and having breakfast or something along those lines. So it's just a very natural thing for me to do. Uh, Mr. Barch, how about you? You, uh, you, you? When you were 15 or 16, you always wear a seatbelt? Sometimes? Most Some, of the time? Sometimes. Never. Sometimes. How about today? Always. No hesitation? None. What could you be at all? What could you be a go for the sometimes to an always? One drowsy crash where I bought two guardrails from the state of Vermont and totaled the car. Wow. Well, so. That was your get out of jail free. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. It well, wasn't that free. <laughs> These are the first belts. These were lap belts. These came out in 1964. You talk to your grandparents. They grew up without seat belts. Anywhere in the United States. Anywhere in the United States there were no seat belts from 1964. All right? And this is the lap belt. Good safety feature, Joe? Yep. Yeah, the best? Not the best. Not the best, but it really keeps you in the car. It does. And then we got this guy here, Niels Bullen. And actually, Cy is going to put his name on the board. All right. It already did, All right? Now, this is 1959. Wait oh, a minute. This is 57. No, it's 59. Sorry. This is a great year. Great year. Yeah. I, 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 I've been seeing it for a long time. It's 57. Somebody corrected me. 59. 61 years ago. Okay. Yeah. So, anyway, this is Neil's Bowling. 
How is this one different than this one? It's got two belts. Yeah. Which one's better? Choice one, uh, Joe, or choice two? Two. Two. Much better. Okay. I'm going to pass it around. This is what a lot of you put on today. And not in school buses. That's a different story, you know. But take a look at Neil's. Say, wow, 61 years. It hasn't changed. And then turn it over and see how you answer the question six. Why not circle the question six? And you said yes or no on that. Okay. Great. Take a look at that. I'm going to ask these folks their seat value here, Joel. Okay. okay. If you give me just a moment, because I want to capture the information that Cy put on the board, and I'm going to step I'd rather, not, I'd rather not the video show the students raising their hand. Um, I can, I'm actually reasonably set up on that, but I will make that more. All right. I've been trying to keep people out of it in general too, so it's we're gonna ask the side and I are gonna ask you your seat values never, sometimes, most of the time, always. And I was asked a driver and teacher, I've done this with it for almost twenty years, because the driver and teacher leaves the classroom and they ask the question, why? Well, if foreign never wears a seat belt, Mr. Barch doesn't need to know who's a never, who's a sometimes, who's a most of the time, who's an always. Okay? Alright, so sorry, let me explain a little bit here about this. Sure. So what we're going to do is I'm going to have you raise your hands um, for those options in the driver's seat, in the passenger seat, in the front, otherwise known as shotgun, and also in the back. Um, we found that people um, people have different habits uh, depending on where they are in the car. So um, remember the options are never, some of the time, most of the time, and always. And just raise your hands uh, for the appropriate uh, timing. So, does that make sense? All right. One thing I will have to, I will remind you is that we're looking for proper seatbelt usage here. So, if you've ever uh, double buckled with someone, or you've put the lap, uh, the sorry, the shoulder harness part around your back and laid down in the car, um, that's improper use of a seatbelt. Um, so, what we would bump you down is from. Uh, an always to most of the time or something along those lines. Does that make sense? All right, awesome. So when you're driving, how many of you never use the, your, or never wear your seatbelt? All right, how about some of the time? All right, most of the time? All right, how about always? All right, great. Okay. So, in, yep, in the shotgun seat or the passenger seat, um, how many of you never wear it in the shopping seat? How many of you some of the time wear it? I'm just gonna go that way, sorry. How many of you um, most of the time wear it? How about always in the shotgun? All right. In the back seat, while the slides put us up there, remember he said if you're taking the seat belt, this bed, and put it behind you. You have most of the time, because then you have the lap belt on. Well, I will actually add this too. A lot of times people your age get in the back seat with more than three people. Right, how many of you been in the back seat with more than three people? Right, if you weren't properly built in this, I said, be it most of the time. Back seat. All right, so back seat. How many of you guys, uh, how many folks never wear it? Do some of the time wear it in the back seat? How about most of the time wear it in the back seat? All right, how about always? God, thank you. Number three? Yes. All right. It's always less, it's always less in the back seat, always. Always. I looked at 50 high schools last semester. I can't remember one school in the state of Vermont that kids in Vermont taking driver ed wore the seatbelt more, uh, uh, more always in the back seat, more than 50% of the time. I was here yesterday, I was here yesterday, did this presentation, and this is yesterday's class. We're 14, 14 out of 14. You folks were 12 out of 13 and 13 out of 13. Uh, 11 out of 13, uh, 11 out of 14 yesterday, and then 3 out of You guys are 3 out of 13. It's always less. Why? Why is it less? You feel more safe. You feel safe. You feel you're right. You, do, you feel safer. You're not safer, but you feel safer. Sometimes you can't find it. Here's the news. The next time you get in the backseat of your car, your family car, sit in the backseat just for a little bit and see if it goes ding, 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 I bet, Mr. I bet the Mount Mansfield driver ed class, does, the driver ed, uh, driver ed uh, uh, car does not have a sensor in the back seat. It ding, 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 ding. Okay. It's not that reminder. It's five times more dangerous. The back seat's five times more dangerous. Mr. Barks, one end, 
Thank you. All right. How about? Kaylee. Kaylee. Yeah. Kaylee. 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 All right. Sorry. Kaylee. You have to roll your eyes. I just couldn't hear you. That's all. I did not roll my eyes. All right. Sorry. I'm sorry. Hey, here we go. Oh, uh, Kaylee. Kaylee. Right? Kaylee. Yes. Thank you very much, Kaylee. Yes. Kaylee. What's the numbers of all this? What's the D stand for? Um. Yeah, what were we here 100%? I mean, what were we here always? How many always wear their seatbelt while they're driving? 12 out of 13. 12 out of 13. And the PS is passenger shotgun? 13 out of 13. Yep, and back? 3 out of 13. 3 out of 13. See, this is really interesting, Joe. So I don't know if I've ever had this happen. More people uh, wear their seatbelt in the passenger than they do driving. Pretty interesting. That is. I haven't seen that. Yeah. Though I did share not only the fall stats at the parent night last night, but the stats from yesterday's class. Yeah, I just see this is here. Okay. Let's go with that. Let's find out about the vaccine. The vaccine's more dangerous. Hey, Kaylee. What's my name? Jim. Jim, come up here, Kaylee. All right, Kaylee's going to be driving. Is she uh, more? Is she, is she likely to wear a seatbelt when she's driving? Twelve out of thirteen. That's probably ninety percent. Let's go with. Hi. Hey, what's your name? Emma. Emma. Hey, Emma. What's, the, what's the likelihood of Emma wearing her seatbelt? Three out of thirteen. Yeah, three out of thirteen. That's uh, that's that probably. Twenty percent. More than that. It's going to be about. Yeah, something like that. Okay. All right. Here we go. Never crash. Let's see what happens with Emma in the back seat. We know Kaylee is going to have a seatbelt on. She's got the airbag, all kinds of protection. She's going to go. Kaylee's going to go four inches. That's how far you go with the Niels Bloomdale. Let's see how far Emma goes in one second. Kaylee's going to be going 30 miles an hour. She's going to hit an oak tree at 30 miles an hour. The car is going to go from 30 to what? Zero. Zero. Let's see how far Emma, without a seatbelt on, goes. Uh, when that car hits the you know, tree at 30 miles an hour. You stand up. Just a little bit of the one. Yep, go forward. No, wait, 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 wait. Go forward. Well, yeah, but you're not going to get boom. Here, wait. I wonder what put here in the, in the middle. In the bucket, in the, bucket with, with the, in the back, in, in uh, the middle. Nothing in front of her because we now have bucket seats. Go ahead. Stop! <laughs> why, why is she stopping? Just a she? All right, now one more time. We'll see how far Emma goes in one second at four equals mass times acceleration. That's the equation for when you hit, when you hit something going 30 miles an hour. Here we go. Okay, you can stand up and we'll start walking, please. And keep on going. Keep on going. Keep going. Keep going, Emma. Emma, keep going. She can stop. Emma, where are you? Hey. Hey. Eva. Um, Emma, where are you? Uh, about five or six steps inside the nurse's office. You okay? Yeah. <laughs> Come on back, Emma. How far did Kaylee go? How far did Kaylee go? Four inches. Four inches. Yeah. Anybody tell you? He goes four inches. That's how far you go to the end. You okay? okay. Probably good, yeah. A little hand for Kaylee and Emma here. All right, now Emma, Emma's right on when she said, I said, you know, just right here, she said, I said, how many probably did? And actually, here's a good still, here's a good statistic for you for the tilt later. That 95% of the time, 95 times out of 100 crashes, the person that was ejected, ejected means what? Yes, or not? Uh, she's DOA. What's DOA? Dead? On. On. Arrival. Yeah. Kind of first responder gets there 95% of the time. Let me see. You okay, Emma? Yeah, yeah. You were good out here. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, wish, uh, I wish Andrew had a seatbelt on. Andrew. 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 And
about what I'm doing is so I come here and talk about this. Um, my date is side right up there is this one here. Worst day of my life. Absolute worst day of my life. Um, because I was involved in that car crash with uh, his Andrea, with and Susan, and myself. We were involved in a car crash. Uh, it was a fatality. It was a fatality. Yeah. yeah. Not me, obviously. I wouldn't be here if I was, if I was living in the family, if I was uh, the fatality. Uh, I go to about 50 high schools a semester doing this. It would be Broward, or Essex, or Dulles Falls, or Lake Region, or Memorial, or Missisquoi. But this is the toughest school for me to come into. Why? Well, because it's a great school, first of all. That's not why it's tough for me to come in here. But our kids went to this school. Andrea went to this school. Senior. Uh, I'm not a Broward talking about Andrea. Eh, you know, it's, it's tough because Andrea's our daughter. Andrea's the one that was, uh, was killed on November 4th. Now she's in the car crash on November 4th. Um, so I might get a little emotional if I do, bear with me. Um, I never get tired of talking about this, ever. I've done it almost 3,000 times. I never ever get tired of talking about Andrea and Susan, her best friend, what happened on November 4th. Um, on November 4th, Andrea is a senior at the school, captain of the soccer team, uh, involved in a lot of activities. Susan, her best friend's driving. Uh, they, they became friends at the Browns from the middle school in the fifth grade. How many of you went to BRMS? Okay, so you know the building. Um, but, but Susan and Andrew became best friends on, uh, when, they be, when they became fifth graders um, the Browns from the middle school. Susan went to the IA, uh, the Central, uh, Andrew went to the IA school. Um, so now it's November 4th, their senior year. And they're involved in, uh, in the yearbook. So on November 4th, they had decided to take pictures at the Browns River Middle School, where half the kids from Mount Mansfield go to the middle school, and then they half go to Camel Stump. Uh, so it's November 4th. Um, Andrew's waiting for Susan to pick her up. Uh, Andrew's going to come uh, to our house and pick up Andrea. They're going to go from our house down to the Browns River Middle School, less than a half a mile from our house down to the Browns River Middle School. So you want to hold the sign? Thanks. So uh, here's what happened. Um, well, Andrew, Andrew sees Susan driving down the road, so Andrew says uh, to, my, to me and my wife, Sue, her mom, uh, so here's uh, Susan coming down the road, I'll be back in half an hour, I'm going to go take those pictures to you. They both always wear a seatbelt. Susan had a seatbelt on, Andrew got in. Now, if you're an always, which most of you are, well, you, all of you are, in the shotgun spot, and if you're an always, you close the door, what do you do next? Well, you don't even think about it. The 13 out of 13 in this class, you don't even think about it. So I have it. Susan said this happened. This is what happened to Andrew. Close the door. Grab for the Neil's wool belt. Probably three times to put the seatbelt on. They found out after the crash that the seatbelt was twisted, had a knot in it. Uh, so they sat in our yard for a little bit. What do you think? Let's go. It's Jericho, Vermont. It's a second. Park, Park Street is really a secondary road. It's a half a mile. Sunday afternoon, chance of any traffic is limited. So they went down the browser in the school, they got out. Actually, there was a janitor in the school, they let him in, it was Sunday. But they didn't let him in, they took pictures of the auditorium, the class, the classrooms, the, the, the gym, all kinds of stuff. Susan said, we go back in the truck, so she told the state trooper, put my seatbelt on. And Andrew again tried to put her seatbelt on, it didn't work. So Susan said, I'm taking, I'm taking you right home. So we, uh, she told the state trooper, we left the Browns River Middle School parking lot, came to a stop sign, stopped. She said, look left, look right, we looked left, we turned to the right, take the her home. Uh, on that corner, as you leave the uh, Browns River Middle School, was a pretty sharp corner there as it moves around out to the center. Um, as we, she, she was going around that corner, as Susan was going around that corner, she said, uh, they practice when I was at three. They both played varsity basketball at this school. Um, when she did that, she listed, you know that term now, she veered into the other lane, crashed head onto an oncoming car. Uh, without a seatbelt, you saw it happen to Helen. Without a seatbelt, Andrew went violently into the windshield. Uh, first responder got there in four minutes. Essex Junction Rescue Squad, the ambulance, we think Essex Junction takes care of our ambulance needs. They get out there in about 12 or 13 minutes. Loaded into the ambulance, rushed into Burlington to the University of Vermont Medical Center Hospital. Got in there in about 32 to 33 minutes. Emergency room immediately put her on life support. 
just lay support. Lay support. Grace. Okay. Well, when you hit your head, hang on, all right? When you hit your head, your brain is going to swell. Can't swell too much because what protects it? Your skull. It's a great thing. But if you hit your head really hard, your brain's going to swell. And it's going to stop swelling because it reaches the outer limits uh, to the skull. And then the blood and oxygen cannot go to your brain and you become brain dead. And you're put on life support. It's a ventilator respirator that allows your body to stay alive. Your brain can be dead, but your body can be kept alive by life support. So now we're at November, uh, now six days, she was in a coma up in room 302. Now we're at November 10th. Um, the neurosurgeon working on Adrian's case came in and every day talked to my wife and I and our kids, Ken, Keith, and Stacy. And um, I said, what he thought was going on with Andrew's brain. And then he uh, came in on Saturday night, but uh, November 10th, and said that your daughter, is, your sister, is brain dead. Can you recover from brain death? No. You can never, ever, ever, ever recover from brain death. Uh, with Dr. Wall that night was a, 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 a social worker, and Mr. Orr, wonderful, wonderful man, very compassionate human being, took her family aside and said, do you ever think Andrew being, a, being an organ donor? No. No. Six days earlier, she, uh, excuse me, uh, that Wednesday of that week before the crash, she was uh, playing in the state semifinal soccer, soccer championship, uh, semifinals. Um, never thought about organ donation. Well, she became an organ donor because we said yes. She donated, uh, she donated her corneas. Thanks, thanks, sorry. She donated her corneas. What's your corneas? In a clear part of your eye. She also donated, that's tissue, that's not organs. She donated her heart, liver, and both her kidneys. Now, the kidneys went to two different people. One person got a kidney, another person got a kidney. Why do I say that? Mm -hmm. yeah, you, don't, you don't need two kidneys to live. I know many, many, many people that were born with one kidney, or donated a kidney, or lost a kidney for some reason, the cancer or something. So, that's, uh, so why are we talking about organ donation? Well, it's a big deal. It is a really big deal in Vermont, a big deal in a lot of states, but it's question six. Everybody who gets your license now, or your permit, or your license, has to say yes and no in question six. Uh, how many of you, uh, just by show of hands here, how many of you are absolutely positive <coughs> you have a heart and a permit? Alright, let's find out what, what this means. Hi, what's your name? Yeah. Anna? Yeah. Hannah. Oh yeah, Hannah. Hannah, yeah, what's your last name? Pats. Pats. Uh, Hannah, why did you say yes on Christian 6? Um, I don't know, just... Oh, say something you shouldn't know, because it's a big decision. Uh, it's a good thing. Well, okay, yeah, yeah, I think it's a good thing. <coughs> but for you to say yes, you should think it's a good thing, too. Okay, here's what happens, Hannah. When Hannah said yes in question six, this is true of any of you that said yes in question six, that information goes right to the University of Long Medical Center Hospital. And there's only one person in the world that can access that. It's a woman named Jennifer DiMaroni. She's the organ procurement coordinator. She has a double password system. And she can see that Hannah's name came up as a potential organ donor. And she would never, I know, Jenna, I know Jennifer really, really well. She would never, ever, ever ask your parent, tell your parents to be a, for you to be an organ donor because you signed your permit. Have you spoken to your parents? Do your parents know that you have a heart in your permit? Good, that's good. There's no, the organs will not be taken from anybody unless a loved one says okay. With you being under 18, your parents have the final say. Uh, I'm over 18 just barely. Thank you. My wife would have to say okay, and I certainly have told her. All right, well, that's a little bit about me. And uh, my message today is have, have some discussion with your parents about this. I'm not trying to convince you to be an organ donor, but sorry, I've got a story that's a little more an awfully uplifting thing here. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Yeah, no problem. So, uh, the reason why I like coming in and talking with Jim is because he gives a really awesome perspective. Um, of the um, organ donor family um, and the, the trials and tribulations that they have to go through, um, especially when the person doesn't uh, let a parent or guardian know what their wishes are. Um, I'm, however, an organ recipient, uh, meaning that uh, I had to 
I had to have an organ transplanted into me for me to survive. Um, essentially, when you do organ donation, um, organ donation is for those people who are really, really sick and are in dire need and they have no other options. So I was out of options, so to speak. And the organ that I received was a heart. Um, I just want to give you some quick backgrounds. When I was uh, about six years old, I was diagnosed with something called restrictive cardiomyopathy. It's a big long word for a stiffening of the heart walls. And this prevents the heart from squeezing fully to get the brain, or the blood all the way up to the brain and to the rest of the organs. And um, if this had progressed, or it started to progress and get worse. Um, as it got worse, I saw more signs and symptoms. So for instance, I would try to go upstairs in middle school and um, at the school that I went to, there's two tiers. There's one stairs and then there's a second stairs up to a second floor. And so I would, I would try to go up the stairs and I'd be like, all right, 10 or 11 steps, I can do this. Whew, maybe not. <sighs> and I would get really, really lightheaded and really fatigued. I'd have to rest on the landing for a couple of minutes and then go and walk back up the rest of it. And by the time I got up to the main floor, the second floor, I was whew, winded and really tired. Um, so if that had progressed any worse, um, I could have had much more worse consequences um, and my heart would have been damaged to the point where they couldn't do an organ transplant. So when I was in eighth grade, they make the decision to put me on a heart transplant list. This is a list um, that um, goes into a national data bank, or actually a regional data bank, um, and you're put on the bottom of the list uh, based off of your age, your blood type, um, and some uh, protein markers that are on your that are inside your body. You have to get a lot of blood work. Um, and so I was on that list and it took me, uh, I believe it was off and on uh, six months until uh, the people of the hospital called me and said, hey Cy, we have a heart for you. And by this time I was in um, eighth grade and uh, dad came into the school and I was one of those kids that never got called to the office, even for small things. So I would go in, uh, when the office came down, they said, Cyrus Roberts, please come and pick up all of your, or, please come to the office with all of your stuff. And I knew that that tagline with all of your stuff, that was a major issue because I was like, uh oh, I'm going somewhere and something's happening that's not, that's gonna be good eventually, but I was not looking forward to the transplant itself. Um, when I saw my dad there, I burst into tears, and uh, with that, we kind of made our way down the ho to the hospital in Boston, because uh, only, the heart will only survive out of, outside of a host's body for only a very small amount of time. So we rushed down to Boston. Um, I got set up in a room. For the first and only time in my life, I folded my clothes, I put it on the bed, um, and uh, an anesthesiologist, which gives you the uh, funny medication to go make you go on to sleep, so to speak, um, came into me and said, "All right, I bet you, I bet you that you can count from five to zero. And I was like, "Okay." I was this, uh, you know, I was this teenager being like, "All right, let's try this." So I try, I got on this Top Gun mask, and I. And with they got the medicine going, and I tried counting down. I was like five, four, three, two, and I didn't remember anything after two or three actually um, until the next day when my chest was on fire, um, and I looked down and I had a, a huge ugly red scar in the center of my chest, and my heart was my new heart was going lub dub lub dub lub dub lub dub lub dub lub dub lub dub, and the reason why that was so significant is because I had never heard felt my heart um, be so strong. Um, when I was younger, my heart always went So when you have a, a healthy heart in you, going loved up, loved up, loved up, it was a totally new feeling. And it was, um, it was the weirdest but greatest feeling that I had up until that point in my life. Um, and 
do you remember me demonstrating how I couldn't get upstairs? Um, by the time I got into high school, that next fall, so I had this transplant over the summer. When I got into the, uh, finally into high school in the fall, I was able to go up steps really easily. Um, I was able to pick up golf again because I loved golfing. I had loved playing baseball, and even though I wasn't um, as strong as the people out there, I used to really like to follow um, baseball and Essex sports, and I had a, a, a lot of fun just hanging out with my friends, able to do a lot of things that they were able to do. Um, and this is because um, of the heart check plan. And now while, like Jim says, I'm not going to try to convince you to be like, hey, mom, dad, uh, I want to be an organ donor. That's great if you do, um, but if you don't, make sure that you have that conversation as well. Because uh, like Jim said, it's you're, especially when you're under 18, uh, your parents or your guardians or whoever is responsible for you uh, in that capacity is going to have to make that decision for you. So um, it's a really hard thing to think about now, but it would be even harder situation if um, something happened to you and you didn't have that conversation. How are you feeling? I'm doing well. You are doing well. Yeah. Yeah. How about some questions? We got a couple minutes here. But, yep. uh, Mister, you want to do some tilts, right? Um, let's take a couple questions. I'll put the sorry, put it on the board right. here. We got a question. Question. Curiosity. Well, I thought most times students will ask, "Hey, what happened to Susan? What happened to Susan? Who's Susan?" She's yeah, her best friend. Right. Her best friend who was driving. And uh, I'll say it this way: nothing physically happened to Susan. I'll say it one more time. I know some of you are shaking your heads. I get it. Nothing physically happened to Susan. <coughs> How do I say it like that? Oh, yeah, she had unbelievable sadness, grief. She couldn't come back to school. She could not come back to school for almost a month. She was so sad about what happened to her friend. Um, could you see about that? Your friend. It wasn't, well, it was, it was Susan's fault that the crash happened, but just remember your friend. Remember your friends when you're driving. Don't start the car until they do a seatbelt. And this was broken, so they wouldn't have gone down and taken the picture. So. <clears throat> yeah. um, so, with like organ donations, um, how do they know that it's a match? Well, so they do blood yeah, tests. Yeah, yeah, so what happens is periodically when you're on the transplant list, they do blood testing. And so I got, uh, every month I would get three or four vials taken out of my body and um, they would check the protein markers and say, okay, you know, this person has this, this, and this, and if the heart had similar proteins, that's how they would match it up. They would also match it up by blood type and they would try to do approximate age as well. But like, how would they know, like, when the person like died or whatever, like in the car crash? So um, I get tested periodically, and then um, if a person um, does ha does become brain dead, they are able to um, test the blood to see if the markers match up with mine. They send the results via the interwebs, and they'll compare it, like on a side, almost like a side by side screen. And then if it's a match or a really close match, they'll call the person, hey, we have, a, we have a heart here that we think is a good match for you. Uh, and at that point in time, you have to rush down to the hospital. Um, and that's how it works. Uh, does that answer your question, kind of? OK, cool. If you're identical twins, you don't even have to do the blood taste. And, 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 but, is that right, Sly? I don't know. Okay. I, mean, I, think, I actually right. don't know. I think it's right. All right. Anything else here? I know you're going to do tilts. We're going to go for tilts, but oh, this is, there's this any is, questions this, first. This, I go to about 50 high schools. This guy is number one as far as technology going and, <laughs> um, and the tilts. He's going to do it electronically, right? We are. And uh, I got yesterday's copy. Here's yesterday's copy of uh, yesterday's tilts. So give me a couple. Give me a couple please go to right Socrative. Here. here we go. one here. I uh, learned that 49 out of 50 states say it's illegal to text drive. The only thing I learned is 90% of car crashes could be avoided. This is a great, great technology, Mr. Burns. You're way ahead of the game here. 